here's my tripod scratch it. <laughs> Hello my dears and welcome back to my corner of the internet. I'm Shannon and today we're going to be reading some more from Pride and Prejudice. Um, we're able to read this on my channel thanks to the website Project Gutenberg that archives um, all different kinds of books once they age out of copyright and then kind of do whatever you want with them. So today we're going to be starting with chapter 47. If you're new to my channel I have a whole playlist um, with all the previous chapters and uh, also last year we did a read through of Emily of New Moon so that's all on there as well so let's just get on into it chapter 47 I've been thinking it over again Elizabeth said her uncle as they drove from the town and really upon serious consideration I'm much more inclined than I was to judge as your eldest sister does on the matter it appears to me so very unlikely that any young man should from such a design against a girl who was by no means unprotected or friendless, and who was actually staying in his colonel's family, that I'm strongly inclined to hope the best. Could he expect that her friends would not step forward? Could he expect to be noticed again by the regiment after such an affront to Colonel Forster? His, his temptation is not adequate of the risk. Do you really think so? cried Elizabeth, brightening up for a moment. Upon my word, said Mrs. Gardner, I begin to be of your uncle's opinion. It is really too great a violation of decency, honor, and interest for him to be guilty of. I cannot think so very ill of Wickham. Can you yourself, Lizzie, so wholly give him up as to believe him capable of it? Not perhaps of neglecting his own interests, but of every other neglect I can believe him capable. If indeed it should be so, but I dare not hope it. Why should they not go on to Scotland if that had been the case? In the first place, replied Mrs. Gardner, there's no absolute proof that they're not gone to Scotland. Oh, but their removing from the chaise into a hackney coach is such a presumption. And besides, no traces of them were to be found on the Barnet Road. Well, then, supposing them to be in London, they may be there, though for the purpose of concealment, for no more exceptional purpose. It's not likely that money should be very abundant on either side. And it might strike them that they could be more economically, though less expediously, married in London than in Scotland. <sighs> why all this secrecy? Why any fear of detection? Why must their marriage be private? Oh, no, no, this is not likely. His most particular friend, you see, by Jane's account, was persuaded of his never ending to marry, never intending to marry her. Wickham will never marry a woman without some money. He can't afford it. And what claims has Lydia? What attraction has she beyond youth, health, and good humor that could make him? For her sake, forego every chance of benefiting himself by marrying well. As to what the restraint, the apprehensions of disgrace in the corps might throw on a dishonorable elopement with her, I'm not able to judge, for I know nothing of the effects that such a steps might produce. But as to your other objection, I'm afraid it will hardly hold good. Lydia has no brothers to object uh, to step forward, and he might imagine from my father's behavior, from his indolence, that the little attention he has ever seemed to give to what was going forward in his family, that he would do that he would do as little and think as little about it as any father could do in such a manner. But can you think that Lydia is so lost to everything but love of him as to consent to live with him on any terms other than marriage? It does seem, and it is most shocking indeed, replied Elizabeth with the tears in her eyes, that a sister's sense of decency and virtue in such a point should admit of doubt. But really, I know not what to say. Perhaps I'm not doing her justice, but she's very young. She has never been taught to think on serious subjects. And for the last half year, nay, for a twelvemonth, she has given up to nothing but amusement and vanity. She's been allowed to dispose of her time in the most idle and frivolous manner, and to adopt any opinions that came in her way. Since the Shire was first quartered in Meryton, nothing but love, flirtation, and officers have been in her head. She's been doing everything in her power by thinking and talking on the subject to give greater, what shall I call it, susceptibility to her feelings, which are naturally lively enough, and we all know that Wickham has every charm of person and address that can captivate a woman. But you see that, Jane, said her aunt, does not think so very ill of Wickham as to believe him capable of the attempt... Of whom does Jane ever think ill, and who is there, whatever might be of their former conduct, that she would think capable of such an attempt till it were proved against them? But Jane knows as well as I do 
what Wickham really is. We both know that he has been profligate in every sense of the word, and that he has neither integrity nor honor, that he is as false and deceitful as he is insinuating. And do you really know all this? cried Miss Gardiner, whose curiosity as to the mode of her intelligence was all alive. I do indeed, replied Elizabeth, coloring. I told you the other day of his infamous behavior to Mr. Darcy, and you yourself, when last at Longbourn, heard in what manner he spoke of the man who had behaved with such forbearance and lib liberality towards him. And there are other circumstances which I am not at liberty, in which, it's not, which it is not worth while to relate. But his lies about the whole Pemberley family are endless. From what he said of Miss Darcy, I was thoroughly prepared to see a proud, reserved, disagreeable girl. Yet he knew to the contrary himself, he must know that she was as amiable and unpretending as we have found her. But does Lydia know nothing of this? Can she be ignorant of what you and Jane seem so well to understand? Oh yes, that's the worst of it all. Till I was in Kent and saw so much both of Mr. Darcy and his relation, Colonel Fitzwilliam, I was ignorant of the truth myself. And when I returned home, the Shire was to leave Meryton in a week of fortnight's time. And as that was the case, neither Jane, to whom I related the whole, nor I thought it necessary to make our knowledge public. For of what use could it apparently be to anyone that the good opinion which all the neighborhood had of him should then be overthrown, even when it was settled that Lydia should go with Mrs. Forster? The necessity of opening her eyes to his character never occurred to me. That she could be in any danger from the deception never entered my head. That such a consequence as this could ensue, you may easily believe, was far enough from my thoughts. When they all removed to Brighton, therefore, you had no reason, I suppose, to believe them fond of each other. Not the slightest. I can remember no symptom of affection on either side, and had nothing of the kind been perceptible, you must be aware that ours is not a family on which could be thrown away. When first he entered the corps, she was ready enough to admire him, but... So we all were. Every girl in or near Meryton was out of her senses about him for the first two months. But he never distinguished her by any particular attention, and consequently, after a moderate period of extravagant and wild admiration, her fancy for him gave way, and others of the regimen who treated her with more distinction again became her favorites. It may be easily believed that however little of novelty could be added to their fierce hopes and conjectures on this interesting subject, by its repeated discussion no other could detain from them it, could detain them from it long. During the whole of the journey, from Elizabeth's thoughts it was never absent, fixed there by the keenest of all anguish, self-reproach. She could find no interval of ease or forgetfulness. They travelled as expediously as possible and sleeping one night on the road reached Longbourn by dinner the next day. It was a comfort to Elizabeth to consider that Jane could not have been wearied by long expectations. The little gardeners, attracted by the sight of the chaise, were standing on the steps of the house as they entered the paddock, and when the carriage drove up to the door, the joyful surprise that lighted up their faces and displayed itself over their whole bodies in a variety of capers and frisks was the first pleasing earnest of their welcome. Elizabeth jumped out and after giving each of them a hasty kiss, hurried to the vestibule, where Jane, who came running down from her mother's apartment, immediately met her. Elizabeth, as she affectionately embraced her whilst tears filled the eyes of both, lost not a moment in asking whether anything had been heard of the fugitives. Not yet, replied Jane, but now that my dear uncle has come, I hope everything will be well. Is my father in town? Yes, he went on Tuesday as I wrote you word. And have you heard from him often? We've heard only twice. He wrote me a few lines on Wednesday to say that he had arrived in safety, and to give me his direction, directions, which I particularly begged him to do. He merely added that he should not write again till he had something of importance to mention. And my mother, how is she? How are you all? My mother is tolerably well, I trust, though her spirits are greatly shaken. She's upstairs and will have great satisfaction in seeing you all. She does not yet leave her dressing room. Mary and Kitty, thank heaven, are quite well. But you, how are you, cried Elizabeth. You look pale, how much you must have gone through. Her sister, however, assured her of being perfectly well in their conversation, which had been passing while Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner were engaged with their children, was now put an end to by the approach of the whole party. Jane ran to her uncle and aunt and welcomed and thanked them both with alternate smiles and tears. 
When they were all in the drawing room, the questions which Elizabeth had already asked were of course repeated by the others. Mrs. Bennet, to whose apartment they all repaired after a few minutes' conversation together, received them exactly as might be expected, with tears and lamentations of regret, invectives against the villainous conduct of Wickham, and complaints of her own sufferings and ill usage. Blaming everybody but the person to whose ill-judging indulgence the errors of her daughter must principally be owing. If I had been able, she said, to carry my point in going to Brighton with all my family, this would not have happened, but poor dear Lydia had nobody to take care of her. Why did the foresters ever let her go out of their sight? I'm sure there was some great neglect on other, on uh, some great neglect or other on their side, for she is not the kind of girl to do such a thing if she had been well looked after. I always thought they were very unfit to have the charge of her, but I was overruled as I always am. Poor dear child, and now here's Mr. Bennet gone away, and I know he will fight Wickham wherever he meets him, and then he'll be killed, and what's to become of us all? The Collinses will turn us out before he's cold in his grave, and if you're not kind to us, brother, I do not know what we shall do. They all exclaimed against such terrific ideas, and Mr. Gardner, after general assurances of his affection for her and all her family, told her that he meant to be in London the very next day and would assist Mr. Bennet in every endeavor for recovering Lydia. Do not give way to useless alarm, said he. Though it is right to be prepared for the worst, there is no occasion to look on it as certain. It's not quite a week since they left Brighton, and a few days more we, we may gain some news of them. Until we know that they're not married and have no design of marrying, do not let us give the matter over as lost. As soon as I get to town, I shall go to my brother and make him come home with me, and then we may consult together as to what is to be done. Oh, my dear brother, replied Mrs. Bennet, that's exactly what I could most wish for. And now do. When you get to town, find them out, wherever they may be. And if they're not married already, make them marry. As for the wedding clothes, do not let them wait for that, but tell Lydia she should have as much money as she chooses to buy them after they're married. And above all, keep Mr. Bennett from fighting. Tell him what a dreadful state I'm in, that I'm framed out of my wits and have such trembling, such flutterings all over me, such spasms in my side and pains in my head, and such beatings at heart, that I can get no rest by night nor by day. And tell my dear Lydia not to give any directions about her clothes until she's seen me, for she does not know which are the best warehouses. Oh, brother, how kind you are. I know you will contrive it all. But Mr. Gardner, though he assured her again of his earnest endeavors in the cause, could not avoid recommending moderation to her, as well as in her hopes as her fear. And after talking with her in this manner till dinner was on the table, they all left her to vent all of her feelings on the housekeeper, who attended in the absence of her daughters. In the dining room, they were soon joined by Mary and Kitty, who had been too busily engaged in their separate apartments to make their appearance before. One came from her books, the other from her toilet. The faces of both, however, were tolerably calm, and no change was visible in either, except that the loss of her favorite sister, or the anger with which she had herself incurred in this business, had given more of fretfulness than usual to the accents of Kitty. As for Mary, she was mistress enough of herself to whisper to Elizabeth, with countenance of grave reflection soon after they were seated at the table. This is a most unfortunate affair and will probably be much talked of, but we must stem the tide of malice and pour into the wounded bosoms of each other the balm of sisterly consolation. Then, perceiving in Elizabeth no inclination of replying, she added, Unhappy as the event must be for Lydia, we must draw from it this useful lesson that loss of virtue in a female is irretrievable and that one false step involves her in endless ruin, that her reputation is no less brittle than it is beautiful, and that she cannot be too much guarded in her behavior towards the undeserving of the other sex. Or underserving, sorry, of the other sex. Elizabeth lifted up her eyes in amazement, but was much too oppressed to make any reply. Mary, however, continued to console herself with such kind of moral extractions from the evil before them. In the afternoon, the two elder Miss Bennets were able to be for half an hour by themselves, and Elizabeth instantly availed herself of the opportunity of making any inquiries, which Jane was equally eager to satisfy. After joining in general lamentations over the dreadful sequel of this event, which Elizabeth considered as all but certain, and Miss Bennet could not assert to be wholly impossible, the former continued the subject by saying, "'But tell me all and everything about it, in which I have not already heard.' 
Give me further peculiars. What did Colonel Forster say? Had they no apprehension of anything before the elopement took place? They must have seen them together forever. Colonel Forrester did own that he had often suspected some partiality, especially on Lydia's side, but nothing to give him any alarm. I am so grieved for him. His behavior was attentive and kind to the utmost. He was coming to us in order to assure us of his concern. Before he had any idea of their not being gone to Scotland, when that apprehension first got abroad, it hastened his journey. And was Denny convinced that Wickham would not marry? Did he know of their intending to go off? Had Colonel Forrester seen Denny himself? Yes, but when questioned by him, Denny denied knowing anything of their plans and would not give his real opinion about it. He did not repeat his persuasion of their not marrying, and from that I am inclined to hope he might have been misunderstood before. Until Colonel Forrester came himself, not one of you entertained a doubt, I suppose, of their being really married. How is it possible that such an idea could, center, could enter our brains? I felt a little uneasy, a little fearful of my sister's happiness with him in marriage, because I knew that his conduct had not always been right. My father and mother knew nothing of that. They only felt how imprudent the match it must be. Kitty then owned with a very natural triumph on knowing more than the rest of us that in Lydia's last letter she had prepared her for such a step. She had known, it seems, of their being in love with each other many weeks, but not before they went to Brighton. No, I believe not. And did Colonel Forrester appear to think well of Wickham himself? Does he know his real character? I confess that he did not speak so well of Wickham as he formerly did. He believed him to be imprudent and extravagant. And since this sad affair has taken place, it said that he left marriage greatly in debt. I hope this may be false. Oh, Jane, had we been less secret, had we told what we knew of him, this would not have happened. Perhaps it would have been better, replied her sister, but to expose the former faults of any person, without knowing what their present feelings are, it seemed unjustifiable. We acted with the best of intentions. Could Colonel Forrester repeat the particulars of Lydia's note to his wife? He brought it with him for us to see. Jane then took it from her pocketbook and gave it to Elizabeth. These were the contents. My dear Harriet, you will laugh when you know where I'm gone, and I cannot help laughing myself at your surprise tomorrow morning. As soon as I am missed, I am going to Gretna Green, and if you cannot guess with who, I shall thank you as I shall thank you as Simpleton, for there is but one man in the whole world I love. He's an angel. I should never be happy without him, so think it no harm to be off. You need not send them word at Longbourn of my going if you do not like it, for it will make the surprise the greater when I write to them and sign my name Lydia Wickham. What a good joke it will be. I can hardly write for laughing. Pray make my excuses to Pratt for not keeping my engagement and dancing with him tonight. Tell him I hope he will excuse me when he knows all and tell him I will dance with him at the next ball we meet. With great pleasure I shall send for my clothes when I get to Longbourn, but I wish you would tell Sally to mend a great slit in my worked muslin gown before they're packed. Goodbye. Give my love to Colonel. I hope you will drink to our good journey. Your affectionate friend, Lydia Bennett. Oh, thoughtless, thoughtless Lydia, cried Elizabeth when she had finished it. What a letter is this to be written at such a moment? But at least it shows that she was serious on the subject of their journey, whatever he might afterwards persuade her to. It was not on her side as, as <laughs> it was not on her side a scheme of infamy. My poor father! How he must have felt it! I never saw anyone so shocked. He could not speak a word for full ten minutes. My mother was taken ill immediately, and the whole house in such confusion. Oh, Jane, cried Elizabeth, was there a servant belonging to it who did not know the whole story before the end of the day? I don't know. I hope there was, but to be guarded at such a time is very difficult. My mother was in hysterics. I'm afraid I did not do so much as I might have done, but the horror of what might possibly happen almost took me from my faculties. Your attendance upon her has been too much for you. You do not look well. Oh, that I had been with you. You have had every care and anxiety upon yourself alone. Mary and Kitty have been very kind and would have shared in every fatigue, I'm sure, but I didn't think it right for either of them. Kitty is slight and delicate, and Mary studies so much. And Lady Lucas has been very kind. She walked around Wednesday morning to condole with us and to offer her services or any of her daughters. They should be of, if they should be of use to us. She had better have stayed home, cried Elizabeth. Perhaps she meant well, but under such misfortune as this, one cannot see too little of one na one's neighbors. Assistance is impossible, condolence insufferable. 
She then proceeded to inquire into the me measures which her father had intended to pursue while in town. He meant, I believe, replied Jane, to go to Epsom, the place where they last changed horses, see the postillions, and try if anything could be done to make out for them. His principal object must be to discover the number of hackney coach, which took them from Clapham. It had come with a fare from London, as he thought that the circumstance of a gentleman and ladies removing from one carriage to another might be remarked. He meant to make inquiries at Clapham. If he could anyhow discover at what house the coachman had been set down before his fare, he determined to make inquiries there. I do not know of any other designs that he had formed, but he was in such a hurry to be gone, and his spirit so greatly discomposed that I had difficulty in finding out even so much as this. <laughs> and that is the end of chapter 47. Oh, that was a longer one, so we're just going to do one today. But anyway, you guys, I hope you enjoyed. I'm going to see you again real soon, I think Wednesday, with another ghost story paranormal video. You guys are really enjoying those. And then again on Friday with another book talk video. See you soon, guys. Bye.